So next up um, is Jussi Gilberg, and I need to make a full disclosure here. So uh, I'm honored to be Jussi's uh, business partner since last Thursday. <laughs> Previously, Jussi has been working on, on the uh, uh, machine learning and artificial intelligence in, in all the university. And, and the business is based on, on, on that thinking and research that Jussi has been doing. So uh, when this presentation <coughs> came up, up Jussi was so busy uh, uh, with, with other stuff and research, so I invented the title, and it's now nice to see what Jussi has come up with. So <laughs> please welcome. Thank you very much, Harry. Yeah, so hello, my name is Jussi. Uh, I used to work at Aalto University. Uh, thank you, Harry, for is this on or not? Yeah, but you have a clicker. Well. Ah, that's great. So, okay. So, okay. So, yeah, Harry already gave the introduction and thank you for the very good title. I think I was able to fill in the substance for the title today. So the background is that I did my PhD work developing machine learning methods for plant breeding. Uh, then I got some funding from the, well, the, nowadays it's called Business Finland ex Tekes. Uh, for commercializing the methods. We worked with a team of five, including Harri, for about one year to commercialize the technology. And now, to, today, we have this yield systems company with which we are selling things that we developed. OK, so I'm going to give a very short, selective history of agriculture only for the needs of my talk today. So it started off around 11,000 years ago. Then there was the Green Revolution not so long time ago, where we, in practice, we learned that if we irrigate and fertilize heavily, we're going to get higher yields. Then what's going on right now is called digital revolution in agriculture. And what we are le learning or what has been learned there is that uh, instead of always using heavy amounts of uh, fertilizers, we can just use image processing to detect the parts of the field that actually benefit from it. Or instead of al always like using lots of fresh water, we can select the times and the places where we actually need the water. So this is very much a case for Israel and areas close by. Uh, well, many speakers have already discussed the emerging food crisis, uh, which is due to the growing population running out of resources. So land is the main thing, of course, but there's also fresh water and phosphorus, which were mentioned, and climate change, not to forget about climate change. OK, so plant breeding, uh, it's a very small part financially uh, of agriculture, but it actually it's quite important. So the question is that what's the role of plant breeding in feeding the population? And uh, a long-term average is that uh, plant breeding is, is responsible for an approximately 1.5% increase annually of food production. So that may not sound so much, but uh, to give a comparison, many people are quite uh, worried about food waste. I don't. This I, I didn't check this number. This is not a scientist talking. But the number I found from Google very quickly was about 30 percent. I believe it's approximately correct. So that's approximately 18 years of plant breeding. So in the long term, we're really dependent on this small branch of science and industry. So, uh, however, plant breeding has several problems uh, right now. Is this the laser? No. Is there a no, there's no laser. OK, so the main problem is that it's not fast enough. So if you look at the graph on the right, if we would want to keep up with uh, population growth, we would need a growth rate of approximately 2.5% per year. And it's a very long way from 1.5% to 2.5% annually. Uh, second problem is that if you look at modern agriculture, we're on a very narrow basis. So we're working with very few crops, so mainly in the image on the right, I don't see if you can see it in the back, but maize, rice, wheat and soybean. Those are the things that have developed a lot, but it's only kind of four crops. And additionally, it's actually quite regional. So here on the, uh, the image here in the, well, your left corner here, the, here are the, uh, the yellow points are the, what has happened to the maize yield in the United States. Uh, the black dots are what has happened in China and the, uh, Purple is what has happened in India. So the maize yields, maize is very much responsible for feeding the planet. So the maize yields have gone up in the US and China, but for example, in India, not so much progress has happened. So this is kind of a global thing. Uh, in the places where there's a lot of money, of course, things have developed, but not on the planet scale. So 
Then, then one problem is the diet problem. So if we think about what we would want to have on our plate, what the doctors tell us that we should eat, and then you look at what we actually produce. We produce maize, rice, wheat, soy, which is given for the animals, then we eat the animals. But it's kind of clear that, that what we're producing is not what we actually should be eating. And this is not a quick thing to solve, so the, that's also a major problem. And then the one last point, I'm not gonna, uh, I don't have an image about it, but it's, it's the decrease in gains per dollar. So uh, uh, in the long term, every new one and a half percent in yield, doing the R&D for that costs, costs increasingly more. So breeding maize has become a lot more expensive than it was like 30 years ago. And well, there are biological reasons for that. Okay, so machine learning and AI. Uh, well, there's a lot of hype around about machine learning, but the way I see it, it's just the most, one of the most recent steps in automation. Nothing more than that. So there are tasks in which humans perform very well, such as image processing. You can show a human an image about an, of an object and the human will be able to say with 99% of accuracy what that object is. This is a task where humans are really, really good. But nowadays, also algorithms are really good at this. Actually, in many problems, algorithms are nowadays better than what humans are. So in the context of uh, agriculture, an example would be that is, this, is the barley field and the image, is it sick or healthy? This is something that an agronomic expert can do. They can actually even guess the disease that is affecting that, that field right there. Uh, but nowadays, this is something that also algorithms can do. So, what we can do is that we can take tasks that used to require a human expert, we can simply automate them. We don't need the human to watch images anymore. That's kind of one of the things that's changing. Then there's a second very, very different line of uh, problems, which is tasks that are completely impossible or virtually impossible for humans. This is one of the things that I, I worked in my PhD. So. Uh, Let's say that we have the historical weather for some location and then we have the genetics of some plant measured using some technology. It's completely impossible for a human expert to say whether the plant with some kind of measured genotype, whether it will do well in that environment or not. Completely impossible. Whereas this is something that we can train algorithms to do. The algorithms are not going to do very well but it's still better than what humans can do. So two things. One is these very simple tasks and then the other end of the spectrum are these very difficult tasks. And AI has a role in automating both. So why machine learning for uh, plant breeding? Uh, well, as I mentioned, we're, we've concentrated, of course there's been breeding for many species and, and all areas, that's true, but, but the main thing is that we're, we're going to need a wider spectrum of everything. More plants, more species, more regional uh, specializing so that the plants are better able to make use of the environment where they are grown. So there will simply be more of everything and because it's not kind of cost efficient uh, if a human tries to do it we're just going to have to automate it and that's naturally called for AI. What we do as a company, by the way how, how am I in the time? Okay. Uh, okay, so predicting how plants respond to their environment uh, I have a video here about it. Maybe I can, yeah, here it is. Yep. So, here's a map of Finland. I assume that everyone recognizes it. And sorry, the video is slightly slow. It was made for another presentation. And basically, what, so this is first the kind of the existing paradigm of agriculture. We assume that we have a target market and we assume that if we have two varieties there, one is simply better and one is worse. And that's the way the world works. There are different, mar well, of course you can always segment the areas in a different way, but this is kind of the conventional paradigm. What we try to do is that, uh, this is by the way the expected yield for two varieties. What we try to do is that based on the soil information and microclimate, we can compute the expected yield of the varieties within that area. So the blue one is the expected yield of one variety and the uh, yellow or whatever color is the expected yield of another variety. And the idea is that then for each location we can simply choose to use the variety that is the best there. Conceptually quite simple. Technically not so. So then, then there's a... Okay, let's just 
second. Uh, okay, that was one of the things that we do. Uh, then there's physical and optical modeling for in silico testing. Uh, just a second. Okay, so this is also a joke. We were always thinking how lodging actually happens. So we did a physical simulation for how it goes. Okay, so of course there are no golden balls that go over actual fields in the nature, but who cares? So, so what is, what's kind of relevant here is that we model the physical properties of, of, of a plant that is growing. And the advantage is that actually if you look at how the, what the lodged uh, uh, stuff there looks like, it can look quite similar to what occurs in nature. So, so instead of doing like the problem in agronomic testing is that you actually need to do it in the summer. That happens once a year. Let's say that if we have 30 years time to develop about 60 or 70 percent more food, that actually means 30 summers of testing. Developing a new property in breeding can easily take for 15 years and you may or even longer and in the last year you may notice that oh crap this didn't work out then you better start again so so it would be quite nice to be do be able to do some things in silico so that we don't need to do like test everything in the field because the summers are so rare okay that's one thing and then the last thing which is actually related to uh, very much related to what Rob already said just a second is that we also do some controlled environment testing. So the problem that we're trying to address here is the same as, as previous while we're doing the in silico things. So we kind of wanted to build a climate change simulator. No, it's not nearly or as automated or fancy as, as the kind of the industrial production facilities that are used in vertical farming. And that's by far not our objectives. We just wanted to be able to produce uh, conditions that we may not see in the field. And yeah, I, yeah. That's it. So I have no idea how I did on the time, but if there is a lot of time left, then we just can have a longer discussion if someone has anything to ask. Thank you very much. Thank you. So, do you have any questions? Yes, about the last uh, picture, it looks yeah. so interesting. You also monitor the, the root growth, the, the growth of the roots. You well, we, we didn't do that yet, but yes, we carry two and a half tons of soil inside to be able to do that. So yes, that's the objective. So that's your plan, like? Yes, yeah. yes, Good. yes. Uh, technical question, have you already finished your thesis and is it somewhere online? That's a question my professor keeps asking me quite often. <laughs> yeah. I, I can tell you that it's worse than when, it's a lot worse than asking a kind of a, elderly female about her age and their answer is no no I haven't this this commercialization project kind of took the most out of me for the last year yeah it's, it's okay it's okay I'll survive but, but there is an article that is pre-published or yes or yes so all the papers have been written and submitted and they can be found online but the introduction part of the thesis is still missing any more questions or, or, or this is uh, a bit maybe a bit of exotical topic in that sense that would you elaborate the simulation part a bit so that or what actually happens and, and how do we use the data there or with the golden balls, Ooh, and, uh, golden I mean, balls. why don't we have that, that kind of a golden ball <laughs> going around it looks yeah. pretty neat well it's yeah well it's it's kind of the <coughs> this is a kind of a difficult difficult topic but but anyway the the point simply is that is that what what uh, what physical and and optical modeling nowadays enable is is really it's really outstanding. So there are many things that you simply don't need to test uh, like experimentally anymore. You can simply run a simulator. Simulator. So this this of course well this is very well, like this has been done for a very long time. For example, in the aviation industry, but we're kind of just we want to take it to the field as well. And no, we can't simulate all properties kind of in a meaningful way, but some properties can and when it is possible it's a lot faster, a lot cheaper than doing an experiment outside. Um, you had this picture that some variety grows in better in some areas and yes. some in some other areas that yeah. got me thinking that how do you, maybe it's not your job but you need to hire somebody to do it, how do you persuade the farmers to actually believe you and change 
their crop variety? Well, because I think that they might be a little bit stubborn. The, the, well, the, yeah, that's yeah. So it is it is a long thing. I would. Uh, the thing is that many advanced farmers already do yield trials themselves. So they take several varieties and test them in their own fields to do the selection. And I suppose that farmers, uh, they do understand the kind of the effect of randomness quite well. They know that things depend on the year. So I, I don't, so I don't think that, uh, well, maybe put it in the global perspective, the, the what's this uh, slogan of Monsanto is the right seed in the right place. So in the global perspective, it's, it's very well accepted. And by the advanced farmers, I think it's quite, it would be quite well accepted in Finland as well. But then there are several, yeah, there are several kind of uh, technical related challenges. Uh, yeah, the way that is, it is solved globally is that, is that basically farmers share their information when they are growing things, then they sh share their information among each others, but but then there is the problem that someone really needs to do the first tests, like they need to do testing without better information before they start accumulating the data, and that's kind of a chicken egg problem. Yeah, and m maybe I just amend a bit about happens to be part of my job also to convince the <laughs> farmers, but but, but any, anyways, they are, uh, as I mentioned earlier in the in the presentation that the traditional kind of a thinking and but also the kind of a very difficult economic and social position where the actual farmer is at the moment in the food value chain. Uh, those are the two biggest, I would say, that, that there is no money to make an investment in a kind of a very advanced technical stuff and also the, the, the heritage and, and traditional thinking and so forth. So which is understandable that the, uh, the, the farmer is taking all the risks with the weather and, and con all, all the risk is basically on the farmer side and the value goes to the up to the streams and up to us basically as end users. So, so the, these are the two things that, that somehow we we'll need to change so that we can convince uh, farmers to actually adapt those methods and, and so forth. And that's the reason we are starting with the plant breeding companies, because there is not that much convincing to do. Yeah, my, I was curious about, uh, do you know uh, if this is already applied in some ways uh, somewhere else in the world? I've, I've only heard about pest location of machine vision. Yeah. Well, well, there are, I don't remember how many, so there are, I would say, hundreds of companies who are using machine learning in agriculture right now. It's quite surprising, but I think two years ago it was the uh, individual most funded uh, uh, industry in Silicon Valley. So that's a lot of money for agriculture, considering it's been quite of a sleeping uh, field for a very long time. And also for plant breeding? Well, no, plant breeding is much more of a niche. Yeah. So, so I, the problem is that, well, the, of course, the agricultural market is maybe 100 times bigger than the plant breeding market. And kind of there are good incentives why people are concentrating on that. But we, we concentrate on the plant breeding part because that's, first of all, where we have kind of most competence. And then secondly, because not so many other people are doing it. Go ahead, Jan. <laughs> yes. uh, so, about the simulation, you yes. mentioned that there are some properties that you can simulate in the plant growth and some you can't. So, yeah. do you have some concrete example of what is something that you can simulate? Well, I do, but I don't want to share them. So, it's kind <laughs> of. <laughs> so, 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 it's, uh, so uh, yes, so, yeah. I'm sorry. That's the answer. It's kind of a, it's kind of a boring answer. But we we have we're not still perfectly open. Uh, we can't be yet perfectly open about all the things that we are doing. But but anyway, uh, just kind of those are kind of technologies in the technology stack that are kind of being used right now and for which we have found use cases. But no, I'm I'm really sorry. I'm, but come back maybe in three months and maybe I can tell more. <laughs> Hi. Thanks. What would what, what do you think is the kind of minimal minimal kind of viable product or service that you'd go out with? I'm trying to imagine, you know, what does the farmer buy, or like who is who is the who is the audience that's going to buy this? It's a service, I guess, right? Yes, so probably a license or a service. Uh, I I would say that uh, well, for example, plant plant breeders need to think about these issues in their every way, everyday work. So especially if they are breeders for a larger area. And, and well, I would say that the minimum viable product for those would be kind of it can 
there are all kinds of analyses that you can do uh, on the plants, for example. Uh, or, but I suppose that the idea would be that it would be integrated as an everyday tool to their workflow, which, which they can use to, for example, re reduce some risks, control some risks that are otherwise kind of inherent in there. Yeah, the, the end, end user is, is a scientific person in, in plant breeding, so we are not addressing directly to the farmer, farmers or, or the kind of the farm management activities because of these kind of, uh, it's, it's pure business reasoning behind that. It's too much of an effort to try to go there directly to the field. Uh, big ones, a field view is, is one company wh wh which is now providing Monsanto's farm management tools and so forth. So. Uh, Monsanto is actually doing the plant breeding and also offering the farm management software on top of that. So, so what we see now is happening is that the plant breeding companies are, are coming into the kind of the more closer to the actual end, end user in, in the farm. But should be faster. And, and I'm not so saying this as a kind of a sales guy for the company, <coughs> but, but really we need, for, we need speed, more speed in, in actually keeping up with the yields and also the extreme weather conditions and so forth and obviously making more diverse portfolio of, of actual plants what we can we can eat and produce it's a simply a risk matter a risk management activity that we do not depend on four different plants over 75 percent of the all calories that we are producing that's insanity i mean there is over 30,000 plants that we could eat and we are only, only using four so Any more questions? Uh, is, is that because, uh, like, does that have something to do with the animal production? Like, the, the reasons why we produce so many, so much of those only for? Yes, it's mainly, mainly so. I don't, well, I think there are experts, better experts on this topic here than I am, but, but basically we wouldn't have meat production without maize. So we wouldn't get the kind of the yields out of the animals without maize. And so soy, soy and maize are, I think, 75% is consumed by the animals or even more. So that's, that's, that is exactly the reason. So the animals eat a lot. So if we would lower uh, animal production, we could use the land to grow. To do yes, yeah. yes. But that's, ki that's kind of, uh, that's kind of, uh, that's a major simplification. So, so the, so the kind of the, uh, so, so uh, well, may, maybe in f f to give an example, maybe in Finland uh, you may have a better, I'm sure you will have an even a better answer for this, but, but in, in Finland, let's say that we may be talking about the increase in eating kind of plant-based things. But if we look at China, it's pretty much the opposite. So kind of, uh, kind of trying to address this problem just by saying, let's just eat less meat, it's, it's, it's not kind of, uh, it's not what's going on. So. I, like it's not sufficient. We need to somehow kind of take into account also that reality, like every day. Yeah, and, and one more comment on that: that what we, we have a bread kind of for these four varieties and other ones, and they might be a good ones, but we haven't been plant breeding them, so they might look like hairy or something. That ugh, you can get this black character. So if we could kind of a plant breed those plants so that they don't have the hair or, or more comfortable for the humans to see and so forth. So would be beneficial, but nobody is breeding them because there is no money related to that. And then when there is no money, then nobody will kind of go go forward. And so there was one more question at least. Yeah. Yeah. Just to comment on this maize thing, yeah. we definitely do not need uh, any any maize to produce meat and, okay. and, and milk in Finland. Yes, That's in Finland, sure. that is true. No, no soy. Yeah. Uh, we think that we there we had to. We have to accept in the future a concept that we are not feeding any food. Yeah. That's a for sure. But that's and not there no, isn't it? no, not in Finland. We are not feeding any maize or soy for, for our animals. And there are a lot of fields and a lot of areas in, in globally where only grass can be produced efficiently. So there is a certain uh, needs for, for the Finnish type yes. animal agriculture, yes. for sure. Yeah. So the not feeding soy or maize goes with the cows and not the, the pigs or, or the yes. chickens yeah. and so forth, but, uh, but in, in, in your line of business you do not you use grass. Yes. 
Okay. And, and the reason for this is that in northern Finland the growing season is so short that you can't actually grow, for example, wheat there. So the only thing that for which the growing season really allows for is growing grass or maybe some very early barley varieties. So if you want to you do something sensible with that land, that would pretty much mean growing grass and feeding it to some animals. Yeah, maybe one important takeaway also is that uh, the, the local aspects, what, what Mikko mentioned in the, in the introductory, so that it's, it's very typical, because agriculture is huge. I can't remember, what was it like four trillion dollars a year or something? I mean, totally surreal, the amount, because we every, everybody who eats is in the business of agriculture. Uh, I heard once, and, and, and that is the, that, because that is so huge, everybody needs it all over the world, it's a global thing, so you, be, you need to be very, very careful in, in investigating the figures that what's going on in a specific region, and, and even that in that region, the microclimate, such things are. And, and as we learned today, also the, the, the false beliefs might be different in different parts of the world, so... so. Thank you. Now we have time for coffee. I hope that you can have a good coffee table discussions and please be back 10 past and, and we will continue.